I live in a small New England city that is nestled up against a river that pours out into the ocean. In that river, the river bridge is a lighthouse. Growing up, I often heard the horn from that lighthouse, guiding travelers in times of fog or storm. I don't hear it anymore. Some of the lighthouse buildings still remain, but they no longer guide travelers during troubled times. They're needed now more than ever. The waters are rough, the times are troubled, and a darkness is settling into everywhere. My name is Will, and this is the Sacred Lighthouse. Sancte Michael Archangeli, defende nos in prelio, contra ne quitiam et insidias diaboli esto presidium. Hi, my name is Will, and welcome to the Sacred Lighthouse. And today I start a new series. I have a bunch of different series here, so you can kind of pick and choose what you like. You know, I have Tales from Medieval Village. I have um, the Trip Around America Quest to See America stuff. I have the Arts and Crafts for, for, uh, talks. I have a bunch of different kind of like general settings. And today I'm going to start a new series that I'd like to do called Little Travel Stories. So let's get started. Um, I'm going to start with Japan. And these are just going to be little stories from my travels around the world. Uh, they might get a kick out of just the big thing for me is, you know, human beings and human nature and just the little things. So Japan. I, um, how do I start this? Let me see. Well, I, my trip to Japan was an ordeal. I live in Massachusetts, so the whole thing took me about, from doorstep to my hotel, took me about 36 hours. I think it was three flights, four airports, you know, a lot of waiting. It was really quite an ordeal. I was exhausted by the time I got there. And um, I, once I got to my hotel, there gave me a room. I went outside to get some fresh air. It was nighttime. And I looked up and I saw the moon. The moon was full. But here's the thing. And part of this was my, I was receptive to things because I was so exhausted, you know. So I think sometimes exhaustion opens you up to impressions and things. But it's a true story. This isn't a dream. You know, I had somebody tell me this must have been a dream. But it wasn't. I um, looked up at the moon and the moon was full. And I saw a long cloud and I'm not kidding in the shape of a dragon really it was an enormous cloud in the night sky and the dragon's open mouth was swallowing the moon couldn't believe it I wish I had my camera with me I would have taken a picture if you can I'm not sure if I could but you know, it was all illuminated by the full moon and uh that cloud I just watched as that dragon shaped cloud I mean it wasn't kind of dragon shaped it was very dragon shaped and the open mouth of the dragon literally just swallowed the moon just the cloud formation moved and just swallowed the moon and i was stunned but there was really something you know and i well anyway on to more stories and i'm going to get back to this that story in a minute but let me tell you a few more stories you know about japanese culture i love japan i love the japanese i love the whole Welt uh, Anschauung, the whole world outlook. The zeitgeist in Japan is pretty amazing. They were wonderful. I, the Japanese are just amazing. But um, I, had my, I had a couple of reasons to go to Japan. One of them was to buy a samurai sword. I wanted to buy an actual sword in Japan. You know, so that was a big thing. But uh, let me tell you a couple more stories. Uh, let me see. My Now, the Japanese are very, very... Um, structured in their social lives. You know, where you fit in society is very important to them. In, in America, or as Americans, we're, we're not. You know, Horatio Alger, I think that's the right name, for us is a big deal. Rags to riches. You don't fit into any particular social cliques. That's, this is Americans, we can do anything. We can rise above and we can, you know, face challenges. But the Japanese culture is very structured. And I noticed this in a few different ways. 
One of which is eye contact and suits. You know, I, I did, I, I spent, uh, uh, let me see, three weeks there, I think. But um, I did a lot of walking around with my backpack, walking around big cities and smaller cities. And I tracked down some bonsai, different bonsai things. And But I noticed that a lot, a lot, a lot of men, young men, wore the same exact suit pretty much with almost no variation, just this gray suit. And then, so I, you know, that was something of note. And I also noted that as the men got older, the older the man, he could vary that suit. There were variations in that suit. So, and I think that's a structural thing. You're expected to conform very strongly. There's a very specific suit and tie that you wear, depending on your your place in the company. As you get older and you rise in the company, you start to have some variations. And the older men in their 60s actually had, you know, colors, a red tie or a little splash of color of this or pinstripes or even a different colored suit that was off the normal gray. I found that interesting, but it's a way to automatically recognize a person's corporate status, I guess. Another thing, too, is eye contact. Now, these young men, I was in my 30s, so anybody who was close to my age or younger than me any man would not make eye contact with me. And if it was, it was it was brief and fleeting. And as they got older, there was a little bit more eye contact. And then the men that were old, really older in their 60s, say, you know, wearing their suits with color in them, and they would actually make solid eye contact with me as we were passing or walking, just distinct, solid eye contact. I thought that's interesting, you know. It, 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 in, in South America... In some cultures here in the, in the Americas, um, eye contact is a machismo thing. You make eye contact, if, you, if you, you look away, you lose machismo, you lose a little bit of macho. It's a thing, you know, so it's a, it's a cultural thing. And Americans, we're, we're very eye contact shy. For us, it's impolite to make eye contact, eye contact for too long. You know, it's just, you know, it's a cultural thing. Um, oh, another story, let me tell you about my hotel. You'll get a kick out of this. Um, the same thing applies with hotels. Now, they have a very structured hotel setup. Like, for instance, the higher you are in stature, say in the corporate status or as a person in society or whatever, the higher they put you in the hotel. And, and we can, you can kind of relate to that when it comes to the penthouse, right? You know, the wealthy people live in the penthouse. And in Japan, the, uh, the higher your status, the higher they put you in the hotel. But it, and that's you know interesting. But there's a little bit of a twist to this. I'll explain this to you. You'll get, get a real kick out of this because it's un-American. It's not very American. We don't do this. But the Japanese, it's very important. Um, I stayed in a five uh, a hotel with five floors, and my room because I booked it ahead of time from America. I was on the third floor, three twenty-two. I think was I think three twenty-two was my room number. And in Japan, you don't keep your key. You get up in the morning, you leave your hotel, you drop your key off at the front desk. And then you, when you come back at the end of the day from business meetings or whatever, you pick up your key. And here's where the fun part comes in. Now, every single time for weeks, I would uh, turn in my key in the morning, go out, adventure out explore things, go to the temples, uh, go to different shops, uh, see Tokyo, whatever. I'd come back, I'd go to the front desk, and I'd ask for my key. And I'd tell them, I'm in 322. And they'd look at me like they didn't understand, which maybe they didn't, but I'm pretty sure they understood almost every time. But this happened to me every single time, no matter who the desk clerk was. Different people, all the time. They would always invariably give me a key from the fifth floor. Right, <laughs> usually five twenty-two, you know. But anything from the fifth floor, they'd give that key to me, and I'd be like, "Oh, thank you very much." But no, 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 I'm on the third floor. I'd give it back to him and say, "Oh, thank you very much. I'm on the third floor. I'm in three twenty-two." And they'd be, they'd apologize and be like, "Oh, okay. Uh, here's your room key." And the interesting thing about this is it's like a saving face kind of thing because it's a compliment. The the, the front clerk. What the front clerk, the desk clerk is saying to me, or to anyone, 
is saying, I looked at you, I sized you up, and you clearly are a fifth floor person. I can see that. <laughs> so here you go. Here's a fifth floor key. <laughs> so I, I just found that really, really interesting, you know. Um, but I'd always give it back and say, no, I'm in 322. Thank you. I'll take my third floor key. So, but, and, I, and it works. It's kind of flattering. Uh, you know, it's a cultural thing. You know, it's very polite. You know, oh, I'm sorry. I made a mistake. I clearly could tell that you're a fifth floor. You're at the top floor kind of guy. <laughs> so anyway, all right, I'll, let me tell you another story. Um, I'm having fun here. I love travel. I'll, I'll do more travel stories. But here's another story. All right, every morning I, you know, get up, shower and shave and whatnot and go down to the little restaurant for breakfast. It's like a, well, it's not really a restaurant. It's like a cafeteria, I guess you could say, right? And it was usually pretty quiet. Not a big hotel. One morning I'm down there and it's me and a young family, about two tables over from me, sitting there at a round table. And the young family is a father, a mother, and two children around 10-ish. And the father's maybe 40-ish, right? And uh, they look very Nordic, tall and blonde. The way they're dressed, I'm like, you yeah, know, Sweden, Denmark, fin Finland, or something like that. You know, uh, Belgium, you know, I don't know. But when I sat down, they had been, they had just sat down and they had started eating. I sat down and started eating and um, we were all using silverware. But the father was watching me very closely because just like I could tell they were one of the Nordic countries, he could probably tell I was American. So, of course, he was curious watching me, everything I do, you know, the way I was dressed and that, how I held myself. Well, I put my fork down and I picked up my chopsticks and I started eating my breakfast with chopsticks, which is fun. And he, he noted that. And uh, then I watched, I noticed that he decided to do the same thing because I'm facile with the chopsticks. It was no problem. He wanted to show me that he could do it too. <laughs> I'm like, oh, this is fun. So he picked up his chopsticks. He started eating his breakfast with his chopsticks. And uh, a little bit of a smug smirk on his face. I, I could do that too, right? I'm like, hmm, we got a thing going on here. Meanwhile, the rest of the family was oblivious to have her fun. The mom and the kids are just eating, you know? But dad's watching me keenly. And then uh, I'm like, all right, let's see what we can do here. So I reach into my little, I have a little satchel. I reach in and I pull out my passport and I look at it. But the thing about my passport is, it's um, I get it in this beautiful leather bound case with... um especially made for passports. It's RFID protected. And it's, I love that case. It's nice. It's elegant. I look at it and I put it away. He looks at me, he watches me, he sees me do this and he trumps me. He's like, okay, all right. He reaches into a bag, remember just do some stuff and he pulls out his passport. Same thing. He's got a nice case for it. Probably RFID protected. And he glances at me. I'm like, oh, game on now, right? <laughs> just for fun. You know, human beings, men doing what men do, right? little bit of competition here. He's like, I'll show this American. Well, anyway, I thought for a second, I'm like, I'm eating my food with my chopsticks. I put my, you know, I put my passport away. He puts his passport away and my food with my chopsticks. And I think to myself, what's my next move here? All right, I got a checkmate. So I checkmate him. This is my checkmate move. I slowly, exaggeratedly reach into my pocket and my jeans, the little pocket, and I pull out a pocket watch. And the little chain jangles. And I could see him just, his eyes go wide. I pull out my pocket watch and I hold it up in front of me. And I press the button so the lid clicks open. And I look at the time. Oh, yeah, it's almost time for me to get going. I cl click the lid closed on the pocket watch. And I slowly and exaggeratedly tuck it away. I glance at him and his mouth is open. He's trumped. He don't know what to do. He's like shocked. He's like, damn, you got me. You got me. So... <laughs> That was it. I won. I guess you could say I won. All in good fun. Finished my breakfast and left. Um, I wonder to this day if that man went out and bought a, himself a pocket watch. All right. Let me see. Two more stories from Japan. I'm having fun. Um, let me see. Oh, yeah. Listen, I I ended up taking you know a bunch of trains. And uh, I even took the bullet train right across Japan from Tokyo to Kyoto. And I'll tell you why in a second. But one interesting thing I did notice was I saw that this one time it was rush hour. I, 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 it was really crowded. A lot of people waiting for the train. It was crazy. I guess it, it probably was around, you know, 5.30 or 6 or something or rush hour. You know what I mean? In the afternoon. And um, 
people were packing onto the train, the subway, I guess you could call it, and uh, all these men come out and come out of nowhere wearing white gloves, Japanese um, uh, railroad workers, I guess you could call them, part of the subway system employees or something, and started pushing people onto onto the train to pack us all in, <laughs> you know, to make more room to push people closer together they were wearing white gloves and there was a bunch of them and i thought it, that is interesting because the japanese protocol is not to be rude you you i think a japanese person generally if the train is crowded they'll just miss the train they don't want to be rude and squeeze in and ask people oh can you move uh, get out of there let me squeeze in here and that's not they you know it's just imply but it's okay if one of the employees, if they have employees with white gloves that just are doing it. It's not you. You're being pushed onto the train and more people are being squeezed in, but you're not doing anything. You're just, you know, you're just a part of the system. So it's, it's, it's not impolite. And I found that really interesting. And uh, on that one particular train that it took that, you know, we were getting, we all got pushed onto and squeezed in. I'll never forget. I was, um, I'm in this one car and it's just packed and because I'm six foot two I'm I'm like literally from my chin up is above the whole everyone else on the train except for one guy way on the other end <laughs> one guy a Japanese guy but the two of us kind of looking at each other over the sea of heads <laughs> I'll never forget. It. I can still see it burned in my brain. That guy looking at me, me and him, the big, two big tall guys. Everyone else almost exactly the same height on the whole subway car. All right, so what, all right, let me finish off my story here. So I'm gonna. This will be the 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 end of my Japanese stories and little travel stories. You get a kick out of this, um, you know. And and this goes back to the golden, the the sacred lighthouse. Because, you know, we, we live in a mystery. This whole thing is a mystery. It's a riddle, an enigma, and a puzzle. And none of us really knows what's going on. And that's beauty in that. I love that, you know. So this is so this story, I'll finish with this where I started and tell you more about the dragon swallowing the moon. Well, anyway, I'm on a tour in uh, Tokyo. And I had been asking people, hey, where do I buy an actual samurai sword? What I'm talking to people. I'm going into different shops. They're selling knockoffs and, you know, you know, $100 swords and this and that, or maybe even. And I'm like, no, I want to buy something real. I want to really actually, you know. And i talking all kinds of, trying to talk to different people. I see, actually, I, one place, I was outside a mall and there was a bunch of military kids there, American military kids, teens. I asked them. They were like, no, we don't know, you know, hey. Talk to the Yakuza, one of them said to me. Maybe you should talk to the Yakuza, which is the Japanese mafia. Well, anyway, I'm on a tour somewhere in Tokyo. And the tour guide is a, a woman who's fluent in English and Japanese. A Japanese woman, fluent. And she, this and that, and this and that. And we got a break, and I said to her, Hey, listen, I want to buy a real samurai sword. Any, any advice for me on how I can do something like that? And she said, Yes. She sat down, and she drew me out this little map. She said, you got to go to Kyoto. She said, near the Emperor's Palace, there's this shop. And she drew a little map on a piece of paper. She said, here, this street, and you take this street, and you go right over here, and it's right over here. And she couldn't remember the name of the shop, but she said, it's right on this. She drew me a little map, and I was like, wow. So sure enough, the next day, I take the bullet train across, right across Japan from Tokyo to Kyoto. And um, I get to the shop, and there it is. All in Japanese. I don't understand any of it, but... I'm, it's five minutes past five and the place is closed. So I had to go back the next day. Well, anyway, I go back the next day and um, I walk in the shop. It's just a small shop. It's, you know, like I don't know, 40 feet by 15 feet, you know, uh, in a really specialized place near the Emperor's Palace. I walk in the shop and facing me is a glass wall case with samurai swords in it and one of them on the sheath of the sword is a Japanese painting of a dragon and a moon 
and the moon is right near the dragon's mouth. And I was like, that's it. I found it. Just like that. My quest was over. All I had to do now was pay for it. Um, so I did. It was just meant to be. So I still have that sword. I had to, I couldn't take it with me. They had, had to go through customs. They had to ship it. And it was a whole big morale. It arrived like several weeks after I got back to America. But um, I have that sword. I love that sword. And um, it was, a bit, you know, it was just, well, I, I, whether it was just a, a serendipitous or a coincidence, I don't know. Or whether it was something deeper to the whole thing, I believe so. I was meant to have it, and now I've had it many years, and I love that sword. Um, so that's it. This is uh, the first installment of little travel stories from the gold, from the golden. Why don't we keep wanting to say the golden from the sacred lighthouse? Um, I'll tell you more travel stories. I got um, just little stories about being a human being, living life, noticing things interacting with other people and other cultures and enjoying and appreciating this beautiful gift we've been given as human beings. Thank you very much.